This is Twit. Well, Aaron, I understand now uh, why we're interested in Europa. It sounds like it's a fascinating place. Obviously, uh, uh, it's it's you know we've been looking at it really closely since since Voyager. But Europa Clipper seems to be a spacecraft of like a different a different family altogether, right? Uh, yeah. It's 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 got this this moon in its crosshairs, and I had the the pleasure of of seeing it just from the little gallery at JPL uh, last year, which was really exciting uh, to see uh, because you, you realize that the spacecraft, they, you think about, Oh, Hey, there's a photo of, <laughs> of me. Love it. um, oh, it's, it's, a, it's so much, it's so much bigger <laughs> than you actually, uh, 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 oh, yeah. you know, think it is when you see it uh, up close and in person. And I was looking at uh, just some like fast facts about, about the spacecraft. And saw like it's it's gonna have like solar arrays, uh, mm -hmm. the size of a of a basketball court. Uh, yeah. You've got twenty four engines on it, uh, and and I guess nine different instruments that are gonna be doing mm -hmm. different things. Yeah. And and I'm just wondering how hard is it to build something to go oh. to a moon like this <laughs> that where you know what you want to find out but you don't know exactly what it's gonna look like, mm -hmm. and then. How do you build that? <laughs> so. Yeah, no, it's been a big engineering challenge, right? And it's also complicated by the fact that you're in this really intense radiation environment of Jupiter, right? Jupiter is so big, it has these um, large and very energetic radiation belts and magnetic field, and that's messing with you constantly too while, while you're in the system, right? So that just adds even more complexity on top of the engineering of having nine instruments, like you said, we actually say 10 investigations because we include the, the communications dish um, as well as one of our investigations because we mm -hmm. use that for science also. Um, but yeah, it's, it's a huge feat of engineering really. Yeah. No ways like, like more than six tons. That's crazy. 1300 yeah. pounds at launch, right? <laughs> yeah. No, and, and it, it is, like you said, really big. And yeah, you can see it in the high bay. Um, there's a YouTube link that everyone can watch it in the high bay. And That's right. there's usually a little mannequin in the shot. Um, and so you can kind of get a sense of scale for how large it is. It's not in the high bay right at this moment because it's up in uh, TVAC and thermal vacuum testing, but it'll be back in the next month or so. And, and for our listeners, if you go to europa.nasa.gov, there's a little live button in the upper mm -hmm. right hand corner called the Clipper Cam. And that's where you can like see all the all the all the fun things when it's going on. That's where um, you can take over control of the probe. Can I ask a quick question there? <laughs> yeah. um, d have you heard any uh, talks up at JPL by a guy named John Cassani over the years? Yeah. Mm -hmm. Absolutely. Have, have you ever heard? Uh, I. I I just have to go through this. This is a story I love to tell. His story about uh, preparing Voyager and the radiation problems. Yeah, yeah. So um, yeah, so I've that's I think like one of the talks I've heard. I've heard him give a talk on on Voyager too. So his talks are always fun because he kind of loves to to stroll off the reservation. But they were preparing for launch. I think they were pretty close, like within months or weeks. And as John tells it, he was, you know, down in down in the workshop working on something. And one of the guys came in and said, we, we got a radiation problem. He said, well, yeah, we know there's radiation there. And they said, no, there's, there's also going to be tons. I think it was tons of static generated by the wiring in the spacecraft. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. So we sent him off to uh, the Safeway down the street to buy some Reynolds wrap to wrap the cable system. Yeah. Which I thought this has to be the cheapest NASA fix in history because the Reynolds wrap was not procured through the system, but it was bought <laughs> down the street at the grocery store. And I thought that's pretty cool. Oh, yeah. We have very a lot of similar concerns on Europa Clipper, too, right? Uh, we call them EMI, EMC, electromagnetic interference and compatibility concerns, right? So you have all these electronics on your spacecraft that are also producing noise. And for some of the instruments on Europa Clipper, particularly the ice penetrating radar, it needs silence, quote unquote, electromagnetic silence for, for lack of a better term um, to really get really good data. And so Europa Clipper has a large concerns about electromagnetic interference and compatibility and a lot of the investigations, the instruments and their um, all, all the electronics in the spacecraft have to be quiet um, so that we can take the data that we need. So could you just give us kind of a, a, a thumbnail of what the instrument package is and what those yeah. do? Yeah, so, okay, we'll start with the remote sensing instruments. So we have ICE, EIS, which is the camera. We have MISE, or the visible camera. We have MISE, which is the infrared spectrometer. We have Ethemus, which is the far infrared, um, more like um, 
uh, thermal thermal emissions. Um, we have uh, Europa UVS, which is the UV spectrometer. We have um, Reason, which is the ice penetrating radar. And then moving more into like the in situ instruments, we have ECM, which is the magnetometer, PIMS, which is the plasma spectrometer. Uh, we have um, we have uh, gravity radio science again, which is that it was we call it investigation. It's not technically an instrument, but it uh, uses the communications dish, that huge dish that you see on the spacecraft mm -hmm. um, to do science at Europa. And then we have uh, mass specs, the mass spectrometer and SUDA, the dust analyzer. So lots of like, again, we're kind of across the electromagnetic spectrum in the in the remote sensing instruments. And then also we have those in situ instruments that are taking data uh, where we are. And, and for those who are not watching the YouTube stream on this, which you probably should be, our brilliant John Salinino on the board was rolling his cursor over those instrument packages <laughs> as you were describing that, which is something I could never have done. So thank you, right. John. You're a saint. One of the unique things, too, about Clipper is that all of those instruments are going to be taking data at the same time. So all of the all of the instruments that have cameras associated with them are all pointed at Europa and all taking data at the same time, which sounds like something maybe logical that you would think happens all the time. But actually, typically on different spacecrafts, some some of the instruments are pointed in different directions and you have to choose which ones you're going to observe with when you fly by a target. And on Europa, on Europa Clipper, all of those instruments are pointed the same direction on the nader deck and all of the instruments will be taking data at the same time which is again just going to produce invaluable science sorry tark have one one quick follow-up uh are these um are these very large orbits that are essentially a flyby or mm -hmm. are they tight orbits around your yeah so we're actually orbiting jupiter and we're performing 49 flybys of europa and so one of the reasons that we do that really the primary reason that we're doing that is because of the really intense radiation environment around jupiter and so um Europa is in that really intense radiation environment. We want to stay out of that radiation environment as much as possible. So we do these really long, like looping orbits around Jupiter and these uh, flybys of Europa so that we can stay out of that radiation environment, reduce costs, reduce mass of the spacecraft, things like that. And this spacecraft is uh, solar panel powered, so you mm -hmm. don't have to worry about plutonium disposal at end of yes. mission, right? Yeah. Well, everything... Aaron JPL builds seems to last forever. Uh, and so <laughs> I mean we, we just we just kind of said goodbye last week to to the Ingenuity spacecraft oh, yeah. or Ingenuity helicopter on Mars mm -hmm. that was supposed to land, you know, fly for a month and it lasted for 3 years. Yeah. Uh, is is 49 orbits kind of like the lifetime because of that radiation environment that you think or or could you squeeze a few oh. more? I'm sure, well, we uh, would love there to be an extended mission, right? So that's the prime mission, those 49 flybys. That's what we'll, we'll have achieved our science goals after those 49 flybys. And then I'm sure we will have more science goals, even maybe potentially even better science goals for a potential extended mission. And we won't know how long that extended mission could be until we really start flying the spacecraft, seeing how it reacts to the radiation environment, seeing how much propellant we're using, things like that, right? So we don't know how long it's going to last and you're never guaranteed an extended mission, um, but we do expect that it'll probably last longer than that. And, and if you are taking readings concurrently with all of the instruments at the same time. Mm -hmm. You know, I, I was looking at some of the key questions. How deep is the ocean? You know, what's mm -hmm. the chemistry like? Uh, I would assume, you know, it would, it might have like, like what are those, those currents and whatnot in our, mm -hmm. in our own ocean. And, yeah. I, and I would, I would, I guess the, the question is, is, is taking simultaneous uh, measurements like that. Um, uh, does it allow you to, to, I guess, marry all of those conditions of what's happening at those different levels at the same time mm -hmm. uh, to give you like like a, a clear snapshot versus having to piece it together over definitely multiple. right you you hit the nail right on the head that's exactly what it is right when you're really trying to address these big questions about the habitability of an ocean the habitability of a body you require different lines of evidence and you really want to have all those lines of evidence at the same time, right? So you're not trying to piece together and have random holes in your puzzle, right? You want to have um, as much data as from as many different viewpoints, if you will, from different 
from like uh, the infrared, from the UV, from, uh, you know, the magnetometer, from the mass spectrometer, all at the same time to, to really create that holistic picture because habitability is not a yes or no, an easy yes or no question. You really need all of these lines of evidence to come together to, to really determine whether um, the ocean might be habitable. Hey, if you enjoyed this clip, be sure to check out This Week in Space. You can find us on your favorite podcast app or see the link in the description below. See you there.